Hello, everyone. I'm Zi Yi Zhou from Shanghai Jiao Tong University, and I'm really grateful to share with you today about the work I did in collaboration with Xin Han, Zhe Yuanchen, Yu Hongnan, Zhe Ruli, and Dao Gu from University of Electronic Science and Technology of China, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, and Zhenya Xin University. In this work, we focus on a recently emerged authentication scheme on mobile platform. This authentication scheme is called one type authentication and is widely used by mobile apps. One type authentication is essentially a third party based authentication scheme supported by mobile network operators. It is similar to other login options such as single sign on. For apps that have integrated this scheme, the app user can log into the app account with the local phone number of the device. Here, the local phone number refers to the phone number that is found to the SIM card on this mobile device. More specifically, as shown in these pictures, the app will display the mask the local phone number as one of the login options. Here, the mask of the phone number refers to part of the phone number, such as the 195. For asterisk 4021 in the picture. If the user chooses to log in by this method, she only needs to tap on the button. Otherwise, she can manually choose to log in by other methods, such as by invoking other apps. What is special about one type of authentication is that during the entire login process, the user does not need to type or paste anything such as SMS one-time password. In addition, one-type authentication also facilitates those users who are disturbed by remembering different passwords for different apps. Given the huge convenience of one-type authentication, many popular apps have introduced one-type authentication schemes. The most unique part in these one-type authentication schemes is that the local phone number is obtained neither through user input nor by requiring any system permissions. Instead, the local phone number is obtained based on the capability of mobile network operators. In the following, we will refer to mobile network operator as MNO for short. In other words, if an app wants to integrate one type of authentication, it has to use MNO's service. There are two ways for an app to introduce MNO service. The first one is to directly integrate the SDK developed by the MNO. In mainland China, there are three MNOs, China Mobile, China Unicom, and China Telecom. The second one is to integrate a third-party SDK. Such SDKs are developed by third-party agents and have integrated MNO SDKs. Typically, these third-party SDKs will include other authentication functions as a syndicator, such as authentication based on SMS one-time password or authentication based on WeChat account. Now, let's focus on the high-level design of one-type authentication services. Before the one-type authentication procedure actually starts, the user's smartphone needs to interact with the MO core network system to perform the AKA procedure and the SMC procedure. After this, the user's smartphone and the MNO core network system have established a secure connection based on the shared root key. Through this secure connection, the MNO core network system has the capability of recognizing the local phone number whenever it receives a data package from an end service. The one type of authentication procedure begins after the secure connection is established. First, in step one, the app on user's smartphone sends app specific data to the MNO server through cellular network. Since MNO has the capability of recognizing phone number, the MNO server can generate a token that is associated with its phone number and transfer it back to the user's smartphone in step two. Then, in step 3, to perform authentication, the user's smartphone needs to send this token to the app server. The 
the app server will forward this token to the MNO server in step 4 in order to get the phone number related with this token. In this way, the app server can know the phone number of the user's smartphone in step 5. Having known the phone number of the user's device, app server can decide whether to allow its login request in step 6. Next, let's have a look at the details of the one-type authentication protocol. We abstract the one-type authentication as a three-phase process. The first phase is the initialization phase. In this phase, the user starts the one-type authentication by typing on the login or sign up button, which results in sending a request to the MNO server. Since MNO has the capability of recognizing phone number, the MNO server already knows the phone number after receiving the request data. Thus, after confirming that the app ID, app key, and app package signature are legitimate, the MNO server will return the user's masked phone number to the MNO SDK. The MNO SDK will pull up an interface and request the user to allow the SDK to obtain a local phone number. The second phase is the token request phase. In this phase, the app client will obtain a token and the token is associated with the app ID, app key, and the local phone number. With this token, the app server can learn the local phone number. The third phase is the phone number obtainment phase. In this phase, the app server will obtain the user's local phone number and decide whether to approve the user's login or sign up request. Specifically, the app client will send the token to the app server, and the app server will forward this token to the MNO server in exchange for phone number. After confirming that the app server's IP has been filed and that the token and app ID are corresponding, the MNO server will respond the local phone number to the app server. Based on this phone number, the app server will decide whether to approve the app client's login or sign up request. Our research looks into the one type authentication services provided by all the three MNOs in mainland China. While there are similar one type authentication services in other countries or regions, they are not included in this study, since it's difficult for us to obtain the real SIM cards and perform the testing in other countries or regions. On the other hand, we imagine that our findings could also bring insights for similar one-type authentication services in other regions. For example, our preliminary investigation showed that the fast login developed by Tercel is similar to the one-type authentication schemes of the three MNOs in mainland China. Next, we will show a fundamental design flaw in such one-type authentication schemes. Exploiting the flaw, we propose a new attack called simulation attack. We first illustrate our attack model, then we will present the implementation details of the simulation attack. We assume the adversary can perform the attack under either of the following two scenarios. In the first scenario, we assume the attacker can install an innocent-looking malicious ad to the victim's device. In the second scenario, we assume the attacker is within the same network as the victim's device. This typically happens when the attacker connects to the hotspot shared by the victim's device. In the meantime, we assume that the victim is under the legitimate usage scenario of one type of authentication. Specifically, there is a SIM card on the victim's device and the mobile data switch has been turned on. Note that the simulation attack has succeeded, regardless of whether the victim phone's WLAN switch has been turned on. We abstract the whole attack process into three phases. The first phase is the token stealing phase. In this phase, the attacker launches the malicious app to obtain a token V. This token V is a valid token distributed to the victim device by the MNO server. Specifically, 
the malicious app on the victim's device obtains the token V by impersonating the behavior of the MNO SDK and sending the app specific data to the MNO server. The second phase is the legitimate initialization phase. In this phase, the attacker performs the normal one type authentication process of the victim app on the attacker's own smartphone. This is because the attacker needs to launch a legitimate app client to communicate with the victim app's backend server for her future unauthorized login. The third phase is the token replacement phase. In this phase, the attacker bypasses the authentication of the app's backend server by replacing the token A with the previously obtained token B. Since the token B is a valid token associated with the victim's phone number, the app's backend server will guide the victim's phone number when it tries to exchange the token for a phone number. In this case, the app's backend server mistakenly chase the attacker as the holder of the victim's phone number, and then approves the attacker's login or sign-up request. Next, let's see the implementation details of the simulation attack. As mentioned before, the attack can be implemented under two scenarios. In the first scenario, the attack is performed via a malicious app. The overall process of this type of attack has been described just now. In the second scenario, the attack is performed by connecting to the victim's hotspot. In this scenario, we assume that the attacker can connect his own smartphone to the mobile hotspot of the victim's smartphone. Thus, the attacker can send app-specific data to the MLO server through victim's cellular network. Then, the attacker follows the same subsequent steps as a previous attack via a malicious app. And finally, the attacker has successfully bypassed the authentication scheme. To better understand how real-world apps are affected by the attack, we performed a large-scale measurement of a set of popular Android and iOS apps. Our final data set includes a total number of 1,025 top Android apps and 894 top iOS apps. Each of these apps holds more than 100 million downloads. Meanwhile, we have investigated three MNO SDKs and 19 third-party SDKs. We proposed a pipeline that integrates both static and dynamic analysis to identify those vulnerable apps. We confirmed that about 40% of the popular apps in our data set are affected by the simulation attack. To detail, for Android apps, our automated analysis pipeline helps us to locate 471 candidates. And our manual verification confirmed that 396 out of these 471 apps are indeed vulnerable to the attack. For iOS apps, the result is similar. Among the vulnerable apps we have identified, 17 apps have more than 100 million most active users, and 87 apps have more than 10 million most active users. According to the statistics of China Internet Network Information Center, the total number of mobile internet users in mainland China has surpassed 1 billion by June 2021, and nearly all of them use services provided by the three major MNOs. Meanwhile, China Mobile claimed that its one type of authentication service has been called more than 1.69 million times by October 2021. Thus, we believe that more than 1 billion users are potentially affected by the vulnerabilities. In addition to the three SDKs developed by the MNO, we also investigated 19 third party SDKs. Among them, eight third party SDKs are found to exist in our app dataset. 
Since the root cause of the vulnerability is the insecure design of the authentication scheme, all these third-party SDKs are vulnerable to the simulation attack. We discovered that the design flaw in one type of authentication scheme may lead to several security risks, and we summarize them as follows. The first risk is that the attacker can perform unauthorized login as a victim user. This has been described before. The second risk is that the attacker can register a new account with the victim's phone number. We observed that a large portion of app providers have simplified their app account registration and activation processes when a user uses the one type of authentication for the first time. Specifically, if the use phone number has not yet been registered to the app service, the phone number will be automatically registered without any user involvement. While this automated process facilitates new users, it actually expands the attack surface of the simulation attack. Even if a user would not like to use a certain app, simulation attack could associate a phone number to a new app account. The third risk is that the attacker can disclose the victim's phone number. This is because when receiving a phone number from the MNO server, some app servers will insecurely return this phone number to the app client. Such an app server can be easily abused as an oracle to obtain the victim's phone number. The fourth risk is the one type of authentication service piggybacking. To use one type of authentication service, developers are required to pay the corresponding fees. However, an app could abuse the one type of authentication service of other registered apps to implement a free and unauthorized use. Our analysis of the identified apps and SDKs also revealed a set of additional implementation weaknesses involving both SDK developers and app developers. The first one is insecure token use. As an important credential, the use of token should have been strictly restricted. However, in reality, some MNO's restrictions on tokens are not strict enough, mainly including allowing the reuse of token, allowing multiple effective tokens, and setting too long validity period. The second one is authorization without user consent. Specifically, one type of authentication SDKs require the app to obtain a user's mobile phone number only after popping up an interface and obtaining user's authorization. However, we discovered that some popular real-world apps have retrieved the phone number before popping up the interface. The third one is plain text storage of sensitive information. Through analyzing real-world apps, we found that Many apps have hard-coded their app ID and app key into program files in plain text form, making it easy for an attacker to obtain the app ID and app key. We argue that the root cause of the flaw is the MNO server's incapability of distinguishing different apps on the same device. Thus, a malicious app can impersonate a benign app. Correspondingly, we propose the following countermeasures by ID certifiers that the malicious app cannot generate or cannot intercept. The first one is to add user input data into the login request. The one type of authentication process could require users to provide some information that is unknown to the attacker, such as her full phone number or her family name. The second one is to add OS level support. OS has the capability of dispatching a token to the legitimate app. Thus, even if a malicious app can send a login request, it cannot obtain the corresponding token and perform the attack. In conclusion, in this work, we uncovered several design and implementation flaws of one type of authentication, 
which has a large usage and high popularity among real-world apps on mobile platform. Exploiting these flaws, we design an attack method to fully bypass the authentication and perform malicious actions to the target app. We perform a large-scale measurement to evaluate the impact of these threats. To achieve this, we propose a pipeline that integrates both static and dynamic approaches to detect potential affected apps. We confirm that about 40% of the highly popular apps are vulnerable to the attack. That's all. Thank you for your watching.